I was wondering if you had a um, quote about your feelings about animals and nature. Well, I love what Aurobindo says about nature being embodied God. And I think that's the key, to understand that the creation is entirely divine and sacred in all of its elements, and that animals are the ambassadors of qualities of God, the representations of different attributes of God, and that we need to realize that elementally because we need to completely rehaul our relationship with animals so as to stop killing them, but also so as to be informed by their wisdom. Yeah. From your point of view, how can we be informed by their wisdom? The deepest secret is always love. Mm. Through letting ourselves fall deeply in love with animals and silencing our minds and our concepts of being superior in some way to animals, we'll then be able to enter into their consciousness through grace and through real prayer and meditation, I found that it's absolutely possible to receive messages and even thought forms from from animals which change our own consciousness and give us access to all kinds of new wisdom. This is not my philosophy alone. This is what all shamans and all indigenous cultures know. Yeah. But it is a revolution now because we created this completely unsustainable world from a fantasy that we have omnipotent right to do whatever we want and superior consciousness in every level, which is a fantasy and absolutely dangerous one now, as we can see. Very lently dangerous. Right. In every sense, spiritually, logically. Yes. Well, we're headed towards total destruction if we continue like this. Not only the destruction of the animals, which is terrible enough, but the destruction of the animal in us. We must never forget that we are also animals. So we have a profound kinship with the animals, which we've spent half of civilization or perhaps whole of civilization ignoring and suppressing, but that it may be the key to our survival. In fact, it is the key to our survival. It's the key to us blessing life. It's the key to us blessing our mm -hmm. bodies. It's the key to blessing our rich and deep emotions. It's the key to this renewed relationship with creation. It's the key to the renewed relationship with animals. There's no downside. It's all joyous, beautiful winning if we do that. That's so absurd. It's the glorious, <laughs> beautiful winning is putting it mildly. It's the key yes. to the regeneration of the planet. It's the key to us arriving here finally, not being drunk on visions of otherwhere, not being drunk on our own power, being so grateful to be part of this glorious creation with our friends and relatives, the animals, that we do everything in our power to protect the creation, to protect the animals and to truly go forward together. Yeah. There's no other way now. No. No. The best way and the only way, both. The best way, the only way, and I think what's happening is that the mother has decided that if we don't do this, we'll be wiped off the face of the earth because, quite frankly, we are now a disease. We are the AIDS of the planet. Why should we be allowed to survive if our survival means the genocide of all her other children? One of the things I love about your work, and I talk about all the time, is your concept of sacred activism. Yes. It is so important, not just to spiritually oriented, it's so important not just to be active without a spiritual background. It's right. the essence of what we need to do. There's no other way now, because it's quite clear that if we continue to believe, like so many New Agers believe, idiots, that just by <laughs> meditating and sending our good vibrations, we're going to undo the structures of cold evil that are creating this planet. This is 
horseshit. And it's quite clear that if we just think like that, we, we might as well just go outside and lie down under a friendly truck. And it's also quite clear that activism in the old model, which is fueled by self-righteousness, blame, superiority, messiah complexes, and endless ego struggles in activist groups, there's nothing real is going to be done. If we were simply reliant on the old models of mysticism and activism, we would be finished. But that's not what we have. We have in these great beings like the prophet, peace be upon him, and in Jesus and in others, and in marvelous modern examples like Gandhi and the Dalai Lama, we have examples of people who know the way through, which is to combine a profound attunement to the sacred, to sacred wisdom, to sacred guidance, with a radical commitment to changing the structures that are now quite clearly threatening human survival. And the truth is that this force is an immense force because if we can fuse sacred consciousness with radical action, our actions will be guided secretly and brilliantly and precisely by the divine and they'll be blessed and great powerful changes can be done very very fast if that's the case but they, and that's what we need we really do need to be channels of miracle at this moment because in many ways we're already living on borrowed time it's amazing that we're still here considering the depth of the mistakes that we've made I love that image, channels of miracles. But it's not just channels of miracles. We have to do the work as well. Well, that's it, because you can't be a channel of miracle if you're not prepared to, to enact what the miracle is. You have to be, being a channel is not a passive thing. It's yeah. you can only be a channel of miracle if you turn up simultaneously open to the sacred and willing to pull, put the sacred guidance into real, radical, urgent, wise action you know that your whole life is that isn't yes it? it is it is that yeah i'm constantly trying to combine all the different levels from the spiritual to the um, emotional the biological the activism they all have to be integrated intellectual they all have to be integrated into one whole way of operating you have the spiritual alone like you say you have the new age or people who are just into trying to change the energies now there's nothing wrong with that it's lovely as long as you also do real action I shouldn't say real action because they would say that is real action. It isn't real. It's, it's not real action but for the very simple reason that very, very few of them are evolved enough to be vehicles of contemplative radiance. They're just mm -hmm. sitting around doing the odd mantra. That's not. If, if, a hermit in the Himalayas who's meditated for 20 years can effect change on the invisible levels, but that takes a very high level of evolution, which none of the new ages that I've ever met or even can even imagine, let alone approach. So let's get absolutely real. There are people on the earth hidden away in caves and hidden away in monasteries who can move the levers of the world by the force of their prayer. But that's not what the New Ages want. They want simply to believe that they're acting while not being prepared to make any of the sacrifices that you've made and I've made to actually be channels of divine truth and action. So I'm, I, I, I don't believe a word of what they're saying. I've seen them for too long. They're narcissists and I'm sick to death of a lot of them. <laughs> Apparently. Okay. <laughs> I, uh, I, 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 I'm too old not to not to just exactly. say it's much too late. It's much too painful. But the truth is that if you do realize that there is this way, and that we must put it into action right now, because we've got very little time. We don't. If we have a decade to turn this around, we are lucky. It's so serious the environmental degradation. It's so serious the genocide of the animals. The World yeah. Wildlife Fund has told us that by two twenty three they'll two-thirds of wildlife will be gone. What is it? It's not just the wildlife that's gone. Every single one of those is an individual being that right. we through starvation. Well, wildlife is itself a ridiculous term, isn't it? Each right. one of them is an embodied soul. Yes, and each one is going to die a suffering death because we are so unfocused and greedy. I mean, every right. single animal that can't find water, that can't find food, is hunting near the edges of humans because there's no other place to go. And this shot, I mean, every single one is a lost being in my mind. Tragedy is well beyond what we are capable of even encompassing, or me personally. 
Well, I think you, I don't agree with that. I think you have been able to encompass it for a very long time. I don't know how you've, how you've borne it actually, because you're one of the very few animal sacred activists that I know, someone who is approaching this, not simply as a, a problem, but as a spiritual tragedy of unimaginable proportions for both the animals and for the human race. And also a spiritual solution. Yes, that's, but you're putting that into action. You're showing it, you're modeling it in your amazing work and in your beautiful writing. And you're sh showing people that the only way to approach this is as a fundamental spiritual revelation and a revelation of what, how we need to change as human beings to get over our ridiculous sense of superiority to animals. <laughs> Where did that come from? I mean, my God, we can't do what the elephants do, transmit thoughts across 70 miles quite casually. We can't do what the lions do in their amazing capacity to run so fast. There's so many skills that the dolphins have, which we are now beginning to begin to begin to understand. There's been a book written about an the, the wisdom oh, of the octopus. Yeah, this one. It's amazing. Yeah. Wonderful. But... For for 2,000 years, we've been under the illusion that our consciousness was somewhere special and it gave us the right to degrade and diminish every other species. This is insanity. It is insanity. I don't know where it came from, but it is it's insanity. It came from the, the betrayal of an ancient matriarchal indigenous world. Um, we knew it absolutely and which knew it deeply. Then we had the growth of the transcendental religions, which of course were a breakthrough in the transcendent dimensions, Hinduism and Buddhism and all of that, but they were also radically dissociated from nature, which they described as an illusion, which again was uh -huh. a fatal, fatal mistake. Nature's not an illusion, it's a manifestation of God. It's embodied God. A wonderful reversal. Yeah. I've spoken with quite a few Buddhist people when I uh, go to study with them, saying I would like to bring animals and nature more into this study mm, good luck no i've had no success um from a nice from a compassionate point of view to really focus on trying to change human consciousness and that's necessary and in order to do that you have to go into yourself and your own consciousness but at the same time when we say um we're doing this work for all sentient beings you have to really think it and mean it not just say the words and not talk about nature as something in addition, it's not in addition. Absolutely. I mean, the in Buddhists part, have a tremendous problem at the core of their philosophy, which is this problem of the world being an illusion. Mm. In real Buddhist philosophy, it's much subtler than that because the world is described as either it's, it's not an illusion and it's not not an illusion. It's, <laughs> it's in between. And that's very profound it's, because obviously this is not the final world. It is a world that's a crystallization of light in all of its particulars. But the reality is that without respecting and adoring and loving nature as divine, and without getting over what is also inherent in both Buddhism and Hinduism, this understanding of our consciousness having unique access to God, mm. without getting over those two fundamental fallacies, we'll never be able to capture what the indigenous peoples had naturally, a deep equality of being mm. with being. Mm. And we can't survive without that. It's the key to our survival. People are approaching it from different ways. And there's always a question. There's a, a very radical guy who speaks with great passion. You may know his work, Derek Jensen. But his ideas, he's saying... I love his work. <laughs> we have, we have totally. to break... <laughs> we have to break everything down and start from scratch. All our institutions basically suck. Richard. Well, he's right. I mean, he's Derek Jensen is a true revolutionary. He has the integrity of that radical passion that everybody needs. The only thing that might be unhelpful about his work is that it simply won't happen without the most bloody and terrible consequences for all of us and for nature itself. The collapse is coming, but whether or not it will birth a new civilization is still open to doubt. It might lead to madness everywhere, Kali dancing her wild dance of destruction. 
We have to act now, even within the constructs of civilization, to help. We can't wait for it all to collapse before we start helping, because the collapse right. doesn't mean the end. You no, see we want to start building from underneath. Right. And that's yeah. what you're doing. That's what I'm doing. We try in all of the ways that we do, with all of the ironies perfectly vivid to us, to work within what we know to be a decadent and destructive system. But what choice do we have? The animals are screaming, the animals are dying, the animals are desperate. We're desperate because we've woken up to what's needed. We have to work with what is. And yeah. that's very, very hard, and, but it demands a maturity of soul, which is very difficult to sustain, impossible to sustain without profound spiritual practice. And other people to talk to. And other people who get it, and other mm -hmm. people who are prepared to witness us too, and prepared to console us when we're out of our minds with grief and despair in the middle of the night, looking at what's going on. So I'm starting these conservation conversations, trying to get to level of supporting one another and being courageous and doing what we each of us can do we'll see Absolutely. how it goes courageous and realistic because a lot of people have courage without realism if you have courage without realism you're just another blowhard because a lot of people who think that they can do far more than we can actually do and so waste mm -hmm. their energies in different projects mm -hmm. without concentrating on what they uniquely give mm -hmm. Do. Exactly. I mean, you yourself, being you with your agony of heart over what's going on with the animals, could have chosen to roam the world and be an advocate and talk about the elephants and the lions and the etc. Cetera, etc., cetera, which might have satisfied your own desire to be important, but you didn't choose that. You chose to hole up in Idaho and do real <laughs> work with a with what you could do. That's a very challenging and very mature choice. It's, and it takes a lot of guts to say, I, I can, can't do this, 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 and this without wasting my energy, but I can do this. And it'll drive me mad, but I'll do it. I don't know how, I, if I see it that way, it's, oh, it's like, first of all, I never had any choice in the matter. It's simply, right. that's what I needed to do. Um, and the other thing is, it seems to me, um, it's simply a clarity of perception. You see yes. it. And then, therefore, obviously, that's what you do. And that's what's difficult in helping other people get their own clarity of perception, what's, what is and what's needed. Well, I, until you realize that people say they want clarity of perception, but in fact don't really want it because it requires and entails responsibilities. So people will spend millions on workshops and read 1,500 books and listen to people like you and myself talking about it and avoid at all costs actually deciding because they know that once they've decided, they'll have to do something. That's the fundamental block in nearly all of the people I teach. And the way I get to them is to say, look, I understand that you have this shadow. I have had it myself, but I've actually seen through it. It was a frightening sight and to really ask yourself one question what breaks your heart the most what really breaks your heart so much that you can hardly bear even to look at it that's what you're being called to address and that's a powerful bitch slap to that kind of subtle ego that is constantly avoiding clarity of perception because it knows that you'll have to do something when you're clear about what you see that's true. Or else know that you're not doing it. <laughs> I'm sorry? Or else know that you're not doing it and have to live with that knowledge. Yes. But then you have, the ego can be very clever. You can then do things that look like it, which keep you cheerful and think you're actually doing something, which aren't something. So clarity of perception is, has to be ruthless enough to be able to unmask the approximations and the fakes it does have to be ruthless. I don't know if it's quite the right word, but it has to be, oh, yeah, merciless. Ruthless is the right word because yes. Kali is ruthless. This is Kali's time. And when she gives you clarity of perception, it is a laser and it pierces you, first of all. It shows us all up to be narcissistic fakes until we don't, until we're not. Frauds until we become real. 
Well, I brought up Derek Jensen because he's on the extreme side that most people can't accept, like we've got to tear everything down. You, as he said, you and I are working within the system to the best we can. But I acknowledge the great truth of what he's saying. Yeah. I don't think we'll have to tear it down. I think Kali will, is tearing it down. It will collapse of its own weight. And what we have to face is that that's coming. But we don't have time not to wait for that to happen. We have to work now to do whatever we can to change this. I'm not working to shore this rotten system up. I'm working to try and give people purpose and passion and focus within this collapsing system so that right. when it collapses, they won't be so overwhelmed by paralysis and madness that they'll right. just go crazy and not do anything. That's, right. that's the game, if you like that anybody serious, I believe, has to play. And I think Derek has, has a very important role and such a beautiful writer apart from anything else. My God, the man can write. And his heartbreak is initiatory. I think if you read one of his books and his scalding critiques, it really does wake people up to what's going on. So he has, for me, a very important function. I choose to do it in a different way, but I do right. acknowledge the seriousness and truth of what he's up to. Do you have any, well, you're, in your teaching, do you have any thoughts and guidance? This could be a silly question, but um, uh, what, if you're going to work within the system, since most people won't work without it, without it, of it, um, what can people do besides try to find their own heartbreak? Or is that well, once you find your heartbreak, you need to create, I believe, what I call a network of grace, because one of the things I've discovered, and I'm sure you've discovered, is that it's almost impossible to do the authentic work of sacred activism without being encouraged and sustained by yeah. other people. You need to have a gang yeah. of sacred buddies who will be with you and encourage you and also hold you accountable. So I've been, I received actually in a dream this vision of sacred act activism being organized through networks of grace, that is groups of between six and 15 people who come together to eat together, to drink together, to pray together, to love each other up, but also to engage in projects together, which they then organize and hold each other accountable. And there are networks of grace now all over the planet. And then you have to decide what it is you're going to devote your synergistic energies to and get working on it in your local community because you yeah. can have grandiose ideas about how you're going to change the world but the prob all the problems of the world are within 10 minutes of anybody's home if they're in a, if, if they're anywhere on the planet at this moment addictions there animal cruelty is there rape is there child molestation is there the horrible treatment of old people is there homophobia is there. So whatever it is that breaks your heart, you've got it in your local community to work on together if you want to. And, you and I would say to. paving over the earth, 20% of the earth being paved over already for roads, yet we have to build another road for another development to take yet more land away from the earth. So it's my focus because yeah, exactly. we're so helpless. Yeah. Well, absolutely. I mean, that's everywhere too. Right. But there is a map, and that's why I wrote The Hope, and that's why my new book, Savage Grace, I think is going to be very helpful for people, because I take what I wrote in The Hope to, when I wrote it with my great friend Carolyn Baker, and I think that these two books offer sober realistic maps and sober realistic solutions and sober realistic ways of organizing yourself with others to do things. And I don't think people have any excuse anymore, either not to be awake or to do the inner work or to start getting going in such groups as Networks of Grace. Because otherwise, when the collapse happens, and it's going to happen soon, it's already happening in America, my God, every day you see another, another stone in the great edifice of American democracy withering. If when the collapse happens, people will simply be crazy, and then that will speed on the extinction of the race when dealing with something very painful and very urgent. And I, the only good thing about Trump is that I think more and more people are realizing that just how dangerous the situation is, but it's not going fast enough, and people aren't doing the inner work deeply enough, and they're not yet. Some of them are, but the majority yeah. are not yet 
bitch slapped awake by crisis enough to get going. But that's our job is to, I'm going to, as long as I'm here, I'm going to just hammer away. I've been thinking about the book you suggested to write, the 120 page book. Right. Um, I don't know how useful it'll be, but I'm going to do it. At this moment, if you think in those ways, you're useful. screwed. You're no, you are useful to be because... your heart out for the sake of God and the animals and do it as well as you can and gamble for God. That's what I feel. I'm going to do it. I was thinking time-wise. Um, time to write takes time to publish. And meanwhile, animals are being extinguished. But I don't know what else I can do that's more potent than that. There's nothing more potent than that. For, very, for two reasons. First of all, you're doing wonderful work. Secondly, you're a damn good writer, and there's so few good writers left on the planet. I mean, the rubbish that is published in the New Age it should make paper ashamed. You write beautifully. You can evoke deep love and deep compassion in your writing because it comes out of your spiritual poetic involvement at the greatest level and the greatest depth with animals. It's it's. There are only two other writers that I think are as good as you. I, Lauren Isley, who is a magician, oh, absolute yes. magician, and Linda Tucker, who is a great shamanic understander of the laws of nature and is putting her life on the line for the white lines. You're in that category. You have an obligation to do it. And let the chips fall where they may. In the end, we're not going to be asked whether we're successful. We're going to be asked whether we were authentic, don't you think? Oh, absolutely. My point was, um, what is the thing that I can do that's most powerful as quickly as possible? That was my only question, being something people have to read, etc. Um, absolutely. But you don't have to wait for some dreary publishing house to publish it. You, I've published my most serious books recently myself. And in fact, it's worked on every level much better because yeah. most of the publishing houses are whores now. They're just brothels, really. And <laughs> they don't want anything serious because they want to sell, you know, tapping your way to happiness or all the rest of it. It's so sick. And at the very moment when the world needs books exactly like you and needs publishers to throw money behind them and get them out, they're choosing to retrench and publish treatises on aromatherapy, which is wonderful, but is not exactly the most acute therapy for our time, which is sacred activism. Um, we've been playing around with the idea of what, what should we call, maybe what we should call what we're doing here. Um, is it in the field of spiritual ecology? Is it sacred ecology? Is it deep ecology? What is it we're trying to do? Sacred activism. I would, I would be thrilled if you did. It's sacred activism for animals. That's it. Don't say sacred ecology because people go to sleep. It's action. Ecology. People hardly know what that, that word means. Mm -hmm. Right, it's action. You're saying, look what's happening. These glorious beings are being extinguished and tortured and degraded and we have turned up to put into action compassion fueled by sacred being by sacred practice in the name of the restoration of the planet that's what you're up to that's sacred activism you're a sacred activist please call it that and i just want 70 percent of all the proceeds now <laughs> Don't fiddle around at this moment with these fancy words. Every time we speak, it should be a blade to the heart. Fair enough. Fair enough. Don't you think? I do. That's what I'm I do. It was something we were trying to do, but um, never mind. It's not nearly as important as what we're talking about, as you said. No, go for it, because your, your, your enterprise is a a model of the new kind of work and it needs to be proud of that and stand by that because what you're doing isn't simply sacred ecology which is a sweet and rather vague term it's a cry to get going and a model of how to get going they're so beautiful every single animal you people ask me what's your favorite animal and i say how you ask that 
How can you ask that? No. Uh, well, I could play cats myself, but no, I... No, you're not allowed. No, I know. Not allowed. So my answer is... Richard, animal is holy and beautiful. <laughs> and cats have initiated me into the glory of all animals. That they can take credit for. Yeah, like you love wolves very deeply and personally, but they've opened you up to the beauty of every animal, haven't they? They have. So my answer when people say that is whichever one I'm with. Right. Animals, whichever one I'm with, because as you start to spend time with anything, be it a coyote or a wolf or a dog or a cat or a tree, you spend time going into this magnificent, magical universe of quality of how a tree operates or how mischievous a coyote is or the wonder is just every, everywhere you look. So you can't have a favorite that limits you. You can have an opener. I think it could work like this. Maybe what the mother does is that she lures you in by the animal that you you most naturally respond to. And that sacred relationship opens you up to the miracle of all animals. I would That's agree with that. To me. So it's, it's as if you're given a, a beloved who then reveals the whole animal world as your beloved. But I, I certainly need to be initiated by cats. And by being initiated by my love for my cats, especially the white lions and my own cats, what they showed me was that the love that I was feeling for them is something I could feel for every other animal. But they yeah. had to, our love, theirs and mine, had to light up the universe before I could see that the universe was lit up already by the glory of that love. Yeah. yeah. I love your image of luring, because I, I do feel like we're lured by love. Yes. Into something. And love is very skillful at using our own predilections to get us into the relationship, which then expands and explodes those predilections and reveals universal love. That's one of its great games, isn't it? It happens in mystical experience, like when with Shams and Rumi. The love between them opened up Rumi to love every stone, every every plant, every animal with a completely new intensity. And that, I think, happens in the relationship between myself and cats and some people with dogs and you with wolves, and then it opens up into the whole thing. Actually, with me, it was a cat originally. Mm -hmm. Yep. A scrawny little thing that was thrown off the side of the road in Kentucky and came onto the farmhouse I was renting. It's one little darkened kitten. And I fell in love so deeply. I've never been as deeply in love as that ever since. And I don't know why. I have no idea how. But it leads to everything else. It falls with this next step. I but think was this the truth for me, too. My first cat was the great love of my life. And her death was a catastrophe. Mm. But in her death, love came even stronger. And at that moment, I really pledged myself to be of whatever help I could in her name to all animals. Yeah, as she died maybe 40 years ago and still brings tears. 40 soul. years ago. Mm -hmm. I can't talk about purple without crying. It's still, mm -hmm. it's a wound that will never heal. Thank God. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm grateful for that unhealable wound mm -hmm. because it's what keeps me an advocate. Well, it's exactly as he said to so that kitty. Not that I didn't love all animals ever since I can remember being conscious. That kitty opened me to depths of things I didn't know existed. And then it's just been a process ever since of ever opening, ever opening, ever opening, ever opening. And I'm, it was very strange because when she died, I'm just... To carry on your thought, I, I was in Oregon giving some workshop and it was by the sea and the tide was coming in and I saw a little insect on the stone. It would have been overwhelmed. So I picked up the stone and, and put the insect tenderly on my hand and then it started to dance with gratitude and ecstasy on my hand. I knew it was saying thank you. And I had no idea until that, that moment that an insect could communicate directly with my consciousness because I was not awake. But that moment woke me up to the, the relationship that we can have with fleas, with mosquitoes, everything. <coughs> it's so much more, it's so much more fabulous, this world, than our, even our normal mystical consciousness reveals. Yes, I think so. Something unbelievably more here. 
a friend of mine was, who's not particularly oriented to nature, really, was taking a walk in the woods. And as he was walking, this mass cloud of tiny little gnats came in front of him. And suddenly, they shaped themselves into an exquisite formation. Right. And then they reshaped themselves into another, and another, and another. And they put on they were a... doing it for him. They were dancing for him. Yes. For about five minutes or so, he said. It was just unbelievable. Yes. And to appreciate it. Yeah. Well, someone once said to me, until we realize that we're living in a reciprocal universe, yeah. it responds to the... Yeah level and acuteness and radiance of our consciousness, we really don't know where we are or who we are. When you yeah. do wake up, you realize that everything is linked. And in, I've just been in Bali, and Bali is an extraordinary place where people do live in this consciousness. So I was sitting with an old man talking about Bali and about other things, and our conversation was being punctuated by bird cries and he said this is a wonderful sign it means that we're actually saying the truth because they're listening and they're responding and they know this it's quite natural for them that's how we used to be that's how we used to live knowing that it's a reciprocal interdependent universe and that everything is connected that's the reciprocal part of it so we can all say it's interconnected which is okay but reciprocal, responsive, bonding is even more vivid. And so I experienced that with... Oh, God, interconnected is like ecology. It's one of those words yeah. which everybody bandies without yeah. the slightest idea of what it actually means. What it means is that a cloud of gnats will dance for you. An insect, if you save yeah. the insect, you'll feel the electric current of its rapture and gratitude going through your body. It means that when you say the truth, a bird will cry out in joy because nature hears you and is so grateful that you finally turned up as a lover. That's what it means. It's a visceral yeah. experience beyond reason, beyond thought. Yeah. And that's why it can only be described, if it can be described, in poetic ways. That's why the poetry of Rumi is so important. The poetry of the great mystics who know this is so important because you can, through loving that poetry and, and really being saturated in that poetry, approximate the kind mm -hmm. of consciousness that the divine is longing to give you. Occasionally when we have retreats here and things are going really well and somebody isn't saying something particularly rich, all the wolves and coyotes will start howling. Right. And it's happened often enough at those moments, it's probably not a coincidence. Are you kidding? You know it's not a coincidence. You, it's a complete, complete yes from the heart of nature. And it happens because we won't let people come for an hour, you know. And we'll no. Come, and you, they have to come and start to seep into that, that level of awareness. Then it happens. Well, it would be wonderful... You know, let me ask you a question. If somebody's listening to this and really wants to enter this consciousness, how would you suggest that they began to prepare themselves? Because it's really important. After all, we're asking people who are in this divided, separate consciousness, who've been given appallingly stupid concepts of what human consciousness is, and even appallingly stupid versions of the mystical journey, and who are living in divided individualistic ways to really enter a reciprocal universe. How do we enter a reciprocal universe? For me, one of the fundamental things is trying to do a deep listening. Mm. And that means being quiet. Absolutely. If you're not quiet. And that doesn't mean a formal meditation, though that's beautifully set up with thousands of years of wisdom behind it. It's simply a capacity in every single human being to do a deep listening within themselves. Which if you go deep enough with yourself, it takes you out to the universe. Or listening within yourself and then to having receiving. So it's the deep listening and the practice of deep listening. One of the things we we're dealing with in these conservation conversations we're doing is it's not enough to talk about something once. You have to commit 
to even if it's deep listening five minutes a day, five minutes a day, three times a day, it reorients you to a whole different way of thinking. That's so true. Do all the time. Um, somewhat naturally because where I live, but it's also a practice, is to try and take in everything that's around me. That's right. I keep, I keep saying we need to expand our sense of community to include all living beings. Whenever we say community, we mean humans. But wait a minute. Any community has water, air, clouds, trees, grass, insects. Where are they? They're part of the community. So you don't. So to never say community is without thinking of the whole community. Not, and to practice really hard and not being human focused, but thinking of what all the impacts the, uh, of your actions are. Um, That's, a, I think, a beautiful response. Deep listening and expanding your vision of what community is. I, I read the most disturbing thing this morning about what's happening in Damascus in Syria. And what's happening is, of course, that Dogs and cats have had terrible suffering and are starving. But also, and this is what was really scary, that the children who've been traumatized by war are torturing the dogs. And hey. Because their whole sense of life has been so rubble that they're taking out their horrible impotence on animals. And the woman who was describing this said, this is almost the most terrible thing of all, that so-called mm. innocent children have become animal tortures because they feel so embattled and impotent themselves that they have no recourse but to torture cats and dogs that are already starving. How often when you read an account of a, a war, do you read any statistics about animals? Exactly. Nothing exactly. mentioned. And what do the you imagine and of track in Puerto Rico? Yeah. And it's crazy. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of, it's a very important suggestion you've made because we've got to get into the habit of realizing that our destructiveness isn't just affecting other human beings, which is terrible enough, it's affecting the entire community of sentient beings. Mm -hmm. Oh. I would add one more thing. I think that it's very important to practice adoration mm. of the beloved in nature, to really tune your heart to the beauty of animals and fields and trees and rivers, to really open the heart. And that's a, it's different from deep listening. It's mm -hmm. a really urgent burning of the heart and that i found is a tremendous door into wisdom of connection because through that all kinds of astounding insights come which rock your world because they don't seem to have any precedent in any text you've read you know but which reveal themselves to be real the universe teaches you through that combination of deep listening and adoration what it really is and how astounding the reciprocal it really is. Yeah, I agree. I like the uh, combination of deep listening and loving, which is the same thing as opening the heart, coming from a loving, open position. I like the word, I love the word loving, obviously, but I love the word adoration because mm -hmm. that's the word, you know, adora means to pray towards. So there is a sense when you adore that you admit your incapacity to understand and you're longing to be instructed. You're, you don't know what you adore. You know that it's real and it's there, but you don't presume to define it because it's so vast. It's a presence of, of holy mystery in and as everything. It's also and more passionate. It's passionate. Mm -hmm. And love, you know, New Age talks about love. Well, what do they, they don't, what do they seem, they don't know about love until they, love is a, passionate fire of adoration it's not love not really it's just a nice little sentimental feeling that's not going to be enough yeah without the passion we don't accomplish anything no it doesn't no. mean anything 
it doesn't mean anything. And without that passion, I don't think we can have the initiation into the reciprocal universe. We can't. Mm -hmm. Only mm -hmm. that passion will, will wipe away the obscurations on our hearts so that reality can shine mm -hmm. its truth in the mirror of our heart. That's been my intense experience, continual experience. That's why whenever I teach, I'd say, you know, meditation isn't enough. Mm -hmm. to also work in the heart. I say to people, you know, you need cool practices to calm down. Those are the practices of listening and they're foundational. Without them, you can't build any kind of in, inner life. But you also need to constantly work on keeping the heart in a state of passionate loverhood of the beloved in and as everything, which is the door, the golden door into truth. Because truth isn't just peaceful, truth is dynamic, truth is a flame, truth is astoundingly beautiful. You know that. Yeah. <laughs> right? I do. If you're in front of a, a wild wolf, and deep listening will be a marvelous beginning, deep listening on every level, being an ear and being deeply... With, Unless you're in a state of adoration towards that wolf, you will never be graced deep union beyond reason with the wolf. You can't get there like that. It has to come through love itself, burning, doesn't it? And I'm afraid I do that every morning. I say hello, and I just say, I adore you. My God, you're so gorgeous. Oh, I do that with my cat. I sometimes I hope that nobody's videoing me yeah. privately because I think I'd be arrested because I talk for hours. I tell her that she's the most beautiful creature in the world and I adore her and that she's a drop of God covered with fur. I, I go for it. But you have it's wonderful, isn't it? Well, I have to tell you they respond. Of course they respond. I mean the leaps and the twirls and the licking and the look and the eyes and the expect and the Wanting a massage, which is the more physical element of it. Um, God, they're so gorgeous. Well, I mean, we, it becomes a complete relationship, which is profoundly erotic. Be, I don't mean sexual, obviously. I mean yeah, of life. Of the whole being, which is really the, the profound initiation, isn't it? Because deep listening is still within the spaciousness of the overmind. But it's only through love that the whole body comes into the relationship. Mm. And when you're saying to the wolf, God, you're gorgeous, it's all of Susan, isn't it? It's mind, oh, yeah. soul, and body saying, I love you. Oh. Right? And okay. I say that to my cat, and that's the key to the unfolding of the reciprocity. It opens the other side. Yes, immediately. It opens the channel. It opens the channel. Yeah. So without that, there can't be this reciprocal universe because unless your whole body is aflame with love for the beloved in the creation, you're really not going to have the initiation. You can't. It's the body of God. You've got to be in God's body, in your own body, through passionate love of the whole creation for the creation to reveal itself as this reciprocal rapture. You're not going to get there without that. There's this painter who just came onto our property by chance called Anne London. I don't know if you know her. She does wildlife. Mm -hmm. I don't I have to see her work. Is it, is it wonderful? It's wonderful. And I, ha and, um, I, uh, I think I sent you, I did send you a latest newsletter. There's a four page interview with her, with some samples of her initial sketches of our wolves and our bears. She said, first of all, you have to be in love or you don't have the energy to carry the project through. Right. Oh, what's wonderful is when she was like five years old in the back seat of her parents' car and she saw birds on a wire. She could feel the wire in her hands. Right. And what she tries to paint is the soul of the animal, the empathy. Right. That's the kind of artist I want around. So, I, yes, that's on our website. Um, I can send you a, uh, our... Well, you you know those extraordinary Chinese and Japanese representations of animals that many of the Zen master calligraphers and artists did in the 11th, 12th, 13th century. Well, one of them said, "You you have no right to paint a fern or a cat unless you have 
first fallen in love, then lost your identification with yourself, then been initiated into the unity of nature. They didn't mm -hmm. pick up the brush until that had happened. That's the way yeah. the electricity of this reciprocal universe is so present in their work. There's yeah. a painting I'm thinking of by one of the great, he's a 14th century Japanese artist, and it's five strokes, and it's the essence of the essence of cathood. It's just the cat leaping, and it, it's, it leaps into the depths of your mind when you look at it. It's so thrilling. And I have a Japanese painting given to me by a friend of ferns, and they, they're literally, as you look in them, they enter into you and wave oh. into own consciousness because that's the state that the artist has achieved yeah or the race, brother. that's what we've got to go for can you take pictures of those and send them to me absolutely and then i can put them on the website as an example of an, mm -hmm. another avenue in it's very we must use everything yeah at this moment i think music too oh yeah to listen to music is a tremendous preparation for learning how to listen to the music of nature yeah i because i love bach and because i love classical music it's helped me attune my ears to how to sit on a porch and listen to the music of the wind you know um prepares us for god's music yeah you know yeah. bernie krauss's work no Oh, well, he went around the world uh, recording all the best last ecosystems he could find that were complete. And this was about, I don't know, maybe 40 years ago. Many of them are already gone, but he has all of those recordings. And he said, when you go to a complete, an area that's not been destroyed yet, every single acoustical niche is filled and not a yeah. piece with another. And you can basically write an orchestra score. Yes. And every time an animal goes extinct, you've lost an instrument but his, his work is incredible about sound and in the, you know the compositions of messiaen the great french composer messiaen was revolutionized by his love of birds and he spent a summer listening to bird song and it revolutionized his vision of music and he created these great mystical masterpieces of sound utilizing the sounds of nature and the instruments so that his his work is a kind of golden scream of ecstasy at the glory of the entire creation. It's an astounding thing. He really revolutionized music through that by listening to the music and realizing that that music is what we need to attune ourselves to for our own survival and for our own true health. So there's different ways. Any, any art form, really, if it's done from the depth, deepest depths. Yes. But I think music especially, and, and painting perhaps. Photography can also be, there are some extraordinary photographs of animals which do convey, but, but some are just, I have a problem with a lot of the photography of animals because it seems yeah. wildistic. It doesn't have the tenderness. Yeah. But to, I, but to say the opposite, I, I've never forgotten a, a National Geographic film, I think it was, that I saw of snow leopards and there was, I think a very inspired cinematographer because they've been looking for the snow leopards forever and of course they're very elusive and then suddenly, suddenly, suddenly they come across five snow oh. leopards playing down a mountain slope and the camera's just trained so patiently and beautifully so that just this miraculous beauty unfolds for 20 minutes before you. And yeah. whoever didn't move that camera and deserves a Nobel Peace Prize because instead <laughs> of trying to follow it, it allowed you to just witness the goddess's glory. It's astonishing, amazing. Yeah. So it, it takes somebody of that kind of sophisticated simplicity. The other thing that's missing in wildlife art is um, perhaps the feminine. You get all these magnificent paintings of um, a stag standing alone on a rock. It's very right. cool of a mothering, loving, or a softness, as you said. It's right. dominated by men. Men isn't the issue, as you know, it's the feminine aspect. Right. 
There are wonderful exceptions. I love Albert Cape, who was a 17th century Dutch painter who painted cows mm -hmm. with infinite love. If you ever look him up, C-U-I-P, he's absolutely amazing. And he, he just painted cows all his life. And people are very sort of derogatory about his work. But actually, and Albert Cape was a visionary. He saw in cows the complete sweetness and benevolence and depth of nature. And his cows are transcendent. Oh, uh, I'd love to look at it. Well, you anywhere you go into the depth, that's what you see. That's what I was trying to say, and you just said it a little better. You know, anytime you go into any aspect of nature, whatever it is, you go into what you what you just said, sort of the transcendent beauty. Well, everything is a hologram of the whole universe, yeah. isn't it? That's what Blake says when he says, see eternity in the grain of sand. You can see yeah. the whole of creation in the eye of your pet. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Every time you go out and say, God, you're gorgeous to a wolf, just saying it to the whole of creation, and all of creation is unspeakably beautiful. And you know what I, I, go ahead. Oh, this is, this is my favorite, favorite thing in Rumi. I remember today, but there's so many, but it's, it's actually usually my favorite thing. He said in one of his, in his table talk, he said, adore the beloved. And the beloved will reveal to you that each thing is a vessel filled to the brim with his wisdom and beauty. One drop from his infinite river of splendor. That says it all. That is why adoration is such a key to the kind of relationship that you and I have being grazed because we've been crazy sane enough to fall irretrievably in love with the animals we love. Irretrievable is a good word. <laughs> yes. You have to be prepared to fall in love irretrievably. You'll never recover from it and it will complicate your life hugely and you'll suffer hugely because you'll then have to face what's happening to the animals you love. But would you have missed it? I nope. wouldn't have. No but regrets. I'm so grateful that I'm beginning to know the kind of world that I'm really in. And whatever it costs the heart, it's worth it. And we said earlier the sacrifices I've made in my mind, I've not made sacrifices. Oh, I haven't made sacrifices not either. Sacrifices. Because it's just what you do in order to get. Right. Sacrifice is mental. When you love, you don't care what happens. Yeah. You just go on loving. You, you know, a mother doesn't, in the end, sacrifice for the child she loves. Right. She loves the child, man, and is prepared to do anything for so her. So you do what you need to do, and that's all there is to it. That's it, right. We have a, a bear. We have five bears. We had six. We have five bears. One of the bears was paralyzed, and through a long story, which is part of this on the website, he's no longer paralyzed. Grizzly bear, like a thousand-pound grizzly bear, magnificent. Mm -hmm. And he was okay with people before. And after he didn't, he recovered. It was through a really interesting, loving healing process, not through medical issues that he recovered. He changed. Mm. And there's a sweetness in his eyes. Mm. When they come to see him, quite a few people just start crying. Right. And it made me think. And the something similar happened with one of our cougars. Mm. Not, not quite as strongly, but similar in a different way with one of our wolves, but with, our, with that bear, people just start to cry. And it started to make me think about the whole idea of transmission, like you have transmission. Oh, yes. But that actually, that animal is giving a transmission. Absolutely. I think, you know, in India, they say that the highest form of transmission from a great master is in silence. And I believe that animals are transmitting that all the time. I had an experience when I was in my 20s in India. What happened was that I came out of the hotel I was staying in, a ropey old hotel in Delhi, and I saw a bus hit a dog, and the dog crawled to the side of the road with its spine broken mm -hmm. and lay in a ditch. And I got frantic and rushed into the hotel and said, please get an ambulance. There's a dog being dying in a ditch and the man looked at me as if i was mad he said there are three million people starving in this city and you expect me to get an ambulance for a dog are you crazy 
So I realized that nobody was going to help the dog. And so I went and sat by the dog as it was dying. And the dog looked at me as it, he was dying with this unspeakable tenderness. Amazing. I can still see those eyes. And I realized I was terrified of him dying. He was not terrified of dying. He'd accepted it. And he was giving me darshan. He was radiating this great peace of being, this knowledge of life and death that animals have instinctually. And as I contemplated those eyes and what they did to me, I realized that the only other eyes that have ever done that to me were the eyes of Ramana Maharshi, the eyes of the great Indian sage that has always been so precious to me. So I believe that animals have the power to transmit the highest spiritual understanding of being, if only we can quieten ourselves to perceive it. And those people in the presence of that grizzly bear are in the presence of embodied peace and embodied love and in silence. Being embodied peace and love. That's what we need to realize about animals. They are great spiritual teachers. It's not just the Dalai Lama that's a great spiritual teacher. That grizzly bear is a great spiritual teacher. That wolf is a great spiritual teacher. My cat, Jade, is a great spiritual teacher. Do you think that um, Dog did that as a um, thank you also because you were sitting there being with him? I do. I think he did it as an act of of love. Mm -hmm. A gift back to your... The reciprocal universe. Yeah. Mm. These are such amazing mysteries we're talking about, aren't they? And there's such holy and beautiful mysteries. And I do think many people know them but they're afraid to talk about them because they think talking about them would reveal them to be crazy. They're not crazy. These are the keys to life. Well, they know them and don't attend to them because they're distracted or don't attend to them deeply enough. Yes, because and also because they haven't ever been given the vocabulary. Yeah. That religion doesn't give them the vocabulary and most mystical systems don't. Yeah. I'm sure that indigenous people would understand everything that we're saying because they experience it directly. But it, in the modern world, it's hard to find people who will admit to the depth of what they've lived with their animals. They say, oh, I loved him so much about the cat, but why, why won't they go the next step and saying, that cat was my teacher, that cat was a revelation to me, a being? Sometimes they do. But it's very important that they do at this moment because it's when you really experience it like that that the passion to protect arises and the passion to act on the behalf of animals arises. Yes. And that's what our job is, isn't it? That's, that's why your book is so important. That's why I'm about to write a book about animals with Carolyn as the, part, as the third book in our trilogy because I want this kind of vocabulary to be available for people yeah and yeah because it gives people permission to, to talk about what they already know yeah. and then galvanizes them to yeah. really say oh my god if my cat and animals are potentially spiritual are spiritual teachers and nature is sacred my god what are we doing and what must we do and what can we have and what can we have? What kind of unbelievable world of sacred That's relations? important. Yeah, really is. important to put that in because it, it's true and it helps motivate people towards something. Exactly. And that's the key because if, if we can, through our own in, willingness to expand and open up to our own experience, share the wonder and amazement mm. and glory of what is revealed mm. to be mm. real all around us, mm. that's worth fighting for. <laughs> that millions, billions of people can have that relationship and live in that relationship. Yes, it's a life well spent fighting for that. Yes. Absolutely. Well, you're going to fight until your last breath and I'm going to fight. Tonight. Oh, yes. Absolutely. <laughs> fight as I'm dying. <laughs> yes. Well, I will be doing Tonglen for the animals when I'm dying. That's what I will. 
to do because I think what we're doing to the animals is literally the worst thing that we do on this planet. It's the sign that we are demented. Serial killers begin their horrible career by torturing animals. Mm -hmm. And by torturing the whole animal race, we're giving a signal that we really are entering into psychosis. It's unbelievable that people can sit about and face the extinction of elephants and lions and tigers with apathy. Is One woman real? came up to it's me and said, to them. it's not real, it's, they're, they're nice on the screen. I gave a speech, you know, a wild speech about animal rights and this very nice woman, I mean, she seemed very nice, she came up to me and she said, you know, it's, oh, you're so passionate, it's wonderful, etc. But why do we need animals? Why do we need animals? I said, I have to be quiet at this moment and take a very deep breath because at this moment I want to wring your neck. I was so upset and it made me potentially so violent. I did warn her and I, I walked away. I said, that's why the human race is dying is because people like you say things like that. Are you crazy? I don't think I made a convert to the animal rights cause at that moment, so I regret having said it like that, but I had to say it because that's so outrageous. And the fact that there can be a human, human beings who can think that, and there are many, you know, we don't need animals, we'll have processed food, or we'll have, them, we'll have lots of lovely films to look at, and then we want to, in between, wondering how our shares are making love over Luxembourg. This is incredible, isn't it? We've got to that kind of... You well, never hear an indigenous person say, why do we need animals? It there strikes me, the friends. apart from the cruelty, is the loss, a huge loss. The in loss, the loneliness. The yes. In the loss of, of awareness and wonder. I think... Isn't that what the, I remember that wonderful Native American prophecy about, the, about these times in which it says that man will end in a great loneliness, having destroyed all his companions. And then we'll discover at last that you cannot eat money. <laughs> I was thinking of this little puppy here who just came over. Um, that's why I was sort of leaning out of the frame. Meet Andrew. Oh. This is going to be Jean's assistant trainer. Oh. He uses an... A, an animal to help him with the other animal. Beautiful. He's a sweetheart. He reminds me about a little white puppy I met in Indonesia the last week. And I went to the shaman's retreat place. It was so beautiful in the middle of the black, field, black rice fields of, of Bali. And this tiny little white puppy came to me and ran around me literally for 15 minutes just pouring out love. I felt so blessed and it'll be one of my most cherished memories all my life. Just that unbelievable innocence and sweetness. Yeah. So to see another being. An underlying can... theme for me is every single animal. So I have a variety of experiences here in species. There's an underlying sweetness in every single one of them. You remember what Gerald Manley Hopkins said that he wrote, there lives a dearest freshness, deep down things. And I think that's what animals teach us the most, because if you really have a profound relationship with an animal, it initiates you into that dearest freshness that's deep down in every being, in every fern, in every leaf, in every yeah. human, however wrecked by yeah. greed and ignorance. And, and that's that what is your whole hope in life, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. I think at this point, it's been a while. I would love to talk to you again. Oh, yes. And we're going to put this out on the... Let's put it, I'd put, love to put this conversation on my, um, on my website because I want people to get to know your work and I want people to really enter this conversation with us. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Can we do that? Yes, I want them to enter into it with us. We'll full absolutely. And uh, yeah, each of us. The next conversation, 
So we have a conversation each month. And then the title of the next one is, We Can Be the Light in These Dark Times. Yes. Don't cast the darkness light a candle.